This webinar is organized uh, by the QCGN, uh, the Quebec Community Groups Network, the Quebec English School Board Association, the English Parents Committee Association, and the Quebec Federation of Home and School Associations. I see already that we have several hundred people um, participating. So it's clear that this is a topic of significant concern for many people um, in education uh, in Quebec, particularly in English speaking, English language education, but I think for the community at large. Um, our topic, as you know, is, is Bill 96 and specifically how it's gonna impact on students in English CEGEPs but also in the elementary and high school. And I think this is gonna have implications for universities as well. Um, and also what's the impact on the institutions. So I'm Michael Goldblum, I am the principal of Bishop's University and I am very pleased to have been invited to, to moderate this discussion. We have uh, about an hour and I'm gonna ask each of the panelists to take up to about 10 minutes to uh, talk to us about their perspectives and maybe we'll engage in a bit of a dialogue. And then if there are questions in the chat, uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I hope we'll have time to get to them. And then we will conclude by asking Russell Copeman, who is the executive director of the Quebec English School Boards Association to offer some concluding remarks. So that's the plan. Um, uh, maybe I'll just say a word additionally about uh, each of the panelists. So Catherine Korakakis is the president of the English Parents Committee Association. Uh, Cindy Finn is the director general of the Lester B. School, Lester B. Pearson School Board. And you'll, um, I hope, accept that I also notice, note that she's a distinguished graduate of Bishop's University. Um, Christian Corneau, uh, Director General of Marianopolis College, and Alexandra Cor Cardona, who is the President of the Dawson Student Union. So uh, four people with very, four different and significant perspectives on Bill 96 and its implications for student success. So Catherine, uh, I think we'll start with you um, and please share with us what your perspectives and concerns are, um, uh, please. So out of all of my tenure of being with the president of, the, of EPCA, I've never had such a reaction. The amount of emails, the amount of phone calls from parents, then when the news was released about the courses uh, for CJEP. And some of the things that our parents are telling is, me basically is they don't know how to protect their child's future. They're, do they sell their house? Do they, find, do they move to another province? Do they find a new job? And again, not every parent can afford to do to do that. Do they spend money on, you know, significantly on tutors? The anxiety from parents, I've never felt anything like this, even given the pandemic, the fears, the worries that their parents are going to fail. And that's the regular stream kids. I'm not even touching on the special needs kids that will not even have an option that in essence, if I look at my son, there's a politician telling me that my son after high school is done with school. There's nowhere else for him to go because there's no way he would ever pass uh, three classes in French at a CJEP level. And, and all of that kind of stuff um, has just this strong undercurrent of fear, anxiety, and really, you know, politicians affecting the future of our children. So those are some of the things that I've been hearing um, from parents overwhelmingly the last uh, two months. Hmm. Now, I may ask this question to all of you, but were, were you consulted, was your organization consulted about, about these proposals before they were introduced? Absolutely not. Hmm. And is there, are there any solutions that you see here? Is it simply to withdraw the proposal? Is there some way to, to is there a way through this? I mean, I think we all feel it's important for our children to learn to speak French. And I know the schools are making a big effort. I would assume that your association yeah, cares about that. 
Yes, of course. But let's not mistake bilingualism with taking CJP level courses, core courses. These are two separate items. Our children are graduating high school. They're able to speak French and they're able to work in French. That's It's a whole other thing being able to take, for instance, you're in science and you have to take a biology course in French. That's a whole other issue. And that's what we're talking about. This has nothing to do with uh, being anti-French, not wanting our children to be bilingual. English speaking parents have have lobbied the government for years to have access to more uh, to more French immersion programs to have access to teachers who can who can teach French in school. This is not the issue at all and we cannot mistake one with the other. Do you have concerns for particular um groups of you know students are there are there some that you think will be more affected than this by other than others or is it something you think is going to have impact across all of the student body i i think across the board when i'm hearing from parents i'm not just hearing from one group of parents i'm hearing from a, parents from across the province of quebec of course more vulnerable populations will have a higher, you know, be impacted higher. Like not every parent can afford to send their kid to uh, Ontario. And that's another thing we're hearing to finish their school or to pay for extra tutoring. And some children have special needs and they don't have the ability to, to complete the, these courses. So, you know, where's the equity in all of this? Where's, where's, where is the opportunities for students, you know, to have the best future they possibly can? Um, all of this is super unfair. And this is what happens when our children are used as political pawns to put forth a political agenda. They were, nobody was consulted. Th this type of uh, measure, this type of amendment that was put forth was done for political posturing. Because if you would have talked to anybody, and we're going to hear from other members of the educational system, they will tell you how it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's, we'll go around the, the four panelists to begin with. So, Cindy, from your perspective, from the from the Lester B. Pearson School Board, what's your what's your assessment of the impact of of this proposed legislation? Right. So, thank you very much for the invitation to be here tonight and and to share some of my uh, my remarks. I, I, maybe I'll preface what I'm going to talk about with just a few general comments, just so people understand my particular vantage point. So my comments are coming from a purely pedagogical perspective, uh, not a political one. I think we can look to the uh, evidence that the Anglophone community, both parents as well as educators, have long embraced this idea that learning French is a good thing, not only for the survival of our students uh, and their functionality to work in Quebec, but just from a cognitive point of view, there are tremendous benefits to learning more than one language. So as someone who's worked in the system for over 22 years, I think we have to unpack this from a pedagogical perspective and, and understand that this is a bill on language, but it is likely going to have a very big impact on education. And the thing we have to also remember as sort of a overarching principle is that education is a, is a system. And you mentioned this principle, Goldblum, that all of the players tonight are interconnected because we're all stakeholders and we have a role to play in the entire Quebec education system. The parts are all interrelated. So yes, as a director general of an Anglophone school board, I have a perspective on the pedagogical merits uh, or pitfalls of this legislation. Um, but I also wear another hat, which is president of a table called LCEQ, which is the leadership committee for English education in Quebec. And around that table, we bring together private schools, public schools, representing the youth sector. We talk with our SAGEP partners. We have universities at the table. We have teachers. We have directors of service. We have people from continuing education. So we dialogue all the time because whatever you tinker with in one part of the system has an impact on the rest of the system. So as someone who works in, in the youth sector and the continuing education sector, I'm responsible for ensuring that our preschool services, our primary services, our secondary school services prepare students for that next step in their educational journey, whatever that may be. Post-secondary studies are definitely uh, a part of, of, of the pathways available to our students. And, uh, and so it's very important that we understand the impact that this bill could have 
on our system, but also on the system that we're preparing our students to move to. And I know my colleague from Marinopolis will speak to that, so I'm not going to touch that so much. But I, I will start by saying that it's important to remember that in Quebec, we're guided by the QEP, the Quebec Education Program. It is very clear, and I'm not going to go deep into the curriculum, but if you were to read that curriculum and have a good understanding of it, it is very, very clear that as a minority language group, our curriculum is designed to teach Francais langue seconde, so French as a second language. That's important because there's a tremendous difference between what mm -hmm. we call in the field L1 and L2. So L1 is your language of instruction. That's your English language arts and so forth. L2 has to do with second language learning. And so we teach Francais langue seconde. And I know in, we've have a, we have a very strong tradition in the Anglophone sector that we've embraced this to the point that we have early immersion programs and we go far beyond the programme de base or the core programme that the QEP prescribes. And we have enriched programmes and, and that's all wonderful, but it is always at the heart, Francais langue seconde. And it's very clearly said in the QEP that the purpose of a second language such as French is to provide students in the Anglophone sector the tools necessary to prepare, uh, to, it's necessary to prepare them to participate in Francophone life and culture as much in the professional sphere as in the personal or social sphere. But at all times, when we look at our, our programs, they are Francais langue seconde. And so the concern is, that with the addition of three additional courses at the CEGEP level, these three courses are in the core area. So it's presuming a level of French competency and proficiency that our you know, elementary and secondary curricula are not designed for. And so my concern is that this will create a barrier for our students. It will be a barrier to success. And that's just really important for folks to understand that Taking a French course to learn a language, that's Francais langue seconde, is a very different enterprise than taking a course in a specific subject area in French. And so this amendment sort of mixes apples and oranges in these L1, L2. And, and so the concern is, is not so much that we haven't prepared our students with a good level of bilingualism. We have. We do have students who leave our system and choose to study in French, either at the CEGEP or the university level. But again, you know, students, when they're moving into post-secondary, they're choosing career paths that, you know, they're going to go to CEGEP, either do a technical three-year program or do the uh, two-year pre-university preparation. Their, their eyes are on the, on the focus of a career path. And so we shouldn't be suddenly concerned is that mark reflecting difficulty in understanding the French and the concepts. And you know, we can easily think if a student is, is oriented toward the, uh, the sciences, can they take a biology course in French? And, and, and perhaps they can, but could not the question be asked at what cost? Because if you're not proficient in the basic core vocabulary of a specific subject domain, you're then trying to master two things at once, the content as well as the language of instruction. And I think that's the biggest concern with this proposed amendment is that we're mixing up language of instruction. And in its original form, there was acknowledgement that English rights holders you know, still have to take courses in French. That's been a requirement in the CEGEP system for a number of years. They do take French courses, but to study core subjects in French was a twist that none of us saw coming and, and just raises concerns because you do have different pedagogical approaches when you're teaching Francais langue seconde versus French as the language of instruction. So maybe I'll just stop there and mm. give uh, more time to move on, but I, I just felt it's important to position the argument from a pedagogical perspective. And that's uh, certainly my main concern and, and wish to represent that perspective here this evening. So Cindy, if I can ask you, I mean, it's a provocative question, but it's the, you know, I've heard this point made in the last couple of days. Um, you know, I think, I think everyone would recognize that the English community, the English school system has made enormous strides in terms of teaching a French to its students. But, but I've heard it argued, well, if you're not, if you're not teaching up to a level so that your, your graduates from 
our secondary schools are able to do three courses in French, it must mean that we're not really preparing our students to be, uh, you know, full citizens in Quebec society. So, I mean, I think you've answered that in, and you've kind of answered that in terms of what we're teaching is people, we're teaching English as French as a second language. We're not, that's not the standard to which we're not, that's not the mandate that you've had. But how do you respond to that? Those people who say, well, it's just, you know, you need to do better. Well, again, I, I go back to the fact that I, I believe the Anglophone community has not only accepted this idea that we need to have French in order to work and, and be productive in Quebec society, we've actually embraced it. Our parents ask for more French than what right. is required by the QEP. And I think it's important to also understand we're talking about a whole collective group of students. Uh, when we are preparing students to graduate with a diploma of secondary studies, they have, a, they have quite a few options open to them. They can enter the job market, they can decide to take a trade and, and stay with us or go to one of the English school boards, or they can decide to go into the post-secondary. And so all of those options should be open to all of our students. And there are students, and I think Ms. Korakakis has already alluded to this, there are some students who work very, very hard to maintain and to have a, a, that level of French proficiency to graduate with a secondary leaving certificate. That doesn't prepare you to go into even a specific trade or a post-secondary program. You will always have to keep improving your French, which is why the requirement already exists to do two French courses at the CEGEP level. So again, I, you know, it's becoming a bit of my mantra as I talk to people to say learning in French is different than learning French. And uh, it's very important that we continue to make that distinction. Right. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you, Cindy. So, Christian, from where you sit, uh, actually leading a college, what's your, what are your concerns and what's your perspective on this legislation? Well, thank you, Michael, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight to share with our uh, those in attendance. And obviously, uh, as you see, uh, a large number of people attending. This is uh, of great interest to to many. Uh, I think uh, Cindy just articulated very well the difference, uh, the significant difference at this bill, uh, if it were to pass. And, and as you mentioned at the onset, it's still a proposed bill at the moment, so it has not been voted on. So, but uh, for the sake of the argument, let's let's assume that uh, it, it were to, to pass. It does introduce uh, a series of fundamental changes to the college system. I've been in the in the CGIP system for over close to 30 years. And this is probably the one single piece of legislation that, that will have the biggest impact on our, on our college system as a whole. We're, we're, of course, talking mostly right now about the French courses, but there are a variety of other clauses that are at play that will significantly impact uh, uh, colleges, in particular uh, English uh, colleges. So in terms of student success, I think some of the uh, potential impact that we see is, is twofold. First, in terms of uh, this impact, the impact that it might have on uh, the ability of a number of students to actually graduate. As my colleague from uh, Lester B was just highlighting, there's a signif significant difference between, I think as she said, uh, learning in French and learning French. So what we can expect, because when students come in currently uh, from the high school system, uh, as was pointed out before, uh, they are required to take two French second language courses as part of the uh, college uh, requirement. But typically, students are being placed at the appropriate level of French, depending on their skill set, typically following a, a placement test. So mm -hmm. some are placed at a lower levels of French, and others are, are placed at, at a different level that is near uh, a near bilingual level. So there's really a wide variety of skill set as they come in. But in the college system, we, we take them for where they come from and try to accompany them through uh, two courses. So clearly, for a significant a uh, number of students and, and the, you know, the percentage will vary uh, depending if you're looking at Montreal or, or, or the regions or depending on the program, but we're talking about at least 30%, if not 50% of students who should feel an impact on this change, either by simply not being able to master the competencies required to pass those core courses, because we're talking about uh, being evaluated in French for your history or physics course. So uh, we should expect a fair number of students who will simply not be able to master those competencies. So either they will fail set courses, take an extra semester perhaps, but in some cases, 
it will likely uh, uh, impact uh, a number of students in terms of not being able to graduate. Uh, or perhaps, as was pointed out earlier, for some students to make a different choice and choose not to go to college and, uh, and make a different uh, decision for themselves. So that's one significant impact, uh, particularly at a time where, uh, you know, there's been much said about the importance of increasing the number of uh, qualified workers. There's a labor shortage that's well documented. So it is somewhat ironic that from the one hand, the government is asking for, you know, more graduates in the healthcare sector, for example, but on the other hand, is introducing a bill uh, related to language that may actually uh, cause for some students to not complete their studies, therefore worsening the impact in terms of that uh, labor shortage. So that's a significant impact on its own. But there are other students who certainly will be able to pass set courses in French, uh, will do okay. But, you know, a number of students, particularly so, uh, you know, our students here at American Office do have their eyes on university. And where, as we all know, in order to be admitted in specific programs, competitive ones like law or, or med school, one needs not just to pass their courses, but to get a good R score. So perhaps a given student would have had, let's say, an 85 or a 90 in the English version of the history course, but now having to take it in French may see their marks, you know, affected to let's say 70 percent, and uh, even a few percentage points can actually make a difference between the necessary R score you need to go to a given program. So the impact is therefore twofold, one in terms of our ability to graduate students and also the ability of students to actually get admitted in the program of their choice at university. So no matter how you look at this, I think for a large segment of the student population, there will be a significant impact on their career choices, on their options, and therefore, I think this is why, uh, as uh, as you know, Michael, a lot of a lot of us in the educational sector have offered all sorts of forms of protest to the government uh, in asking for something to be done. Because in its current uh, iteration, uh, this will have very negative and significant impact on student success and their 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 careers and outlook. Uh, so we're talking about major issues uh, for the anglophone community. Christian, are you concerned about the impact even on enrollment? I mean, do you think that this may? Well, it, it, yes, I, I think uh, partly because of that article, but also because of other uh, elements of the bill. But uh, we've, we've heard already some parents who are thinking about perhaps choosing to go to Ontario as opposed to studying in Quebec, perhaps not even continuing college studies and entering directly the labor market. So I think it's to be expected that in some cases it might affect uh, enrollment, but I'd say I'm more preoccupied with the fact that some students overnight from the pre-Bill 96 to the post-Bill 96 will lose an opportunity to get the education that they deserve. So that's probably, I think, at the top of, of the list of, in terms of concerns. And this distinction between learning in French and learning French, um, I always, I mean, you're not the, the author of this, but why, why did they, or where did this idea come from of uh, creating requirements to take courses in French rather than, you know, more courses, let's say, uh, in learning French? Why wouldn't, why, why the emphasis on taking, a, a, you know, courses in French rather than on the on the learning of, of the language itself. Well, as I think as Catherine mentioned at the onset, uh, this is you know I would say probably the worst possible context one could imagine for a bill to be studied of this importance just before an election, and there was a bit of a race between the different uh, I think political parties of who's going to be the more pro French or will outdo the other in terms of proposing measures. So it, it was something that came out. You asked before whether we were consulted. Yes, I was uh, certainly not on that particular aspect. This was an amendment that came uh, uh, more or less out of left field. Uh, we, we saw this uh, live being played out on, on uh, during the parliamentary commission, where suddenly politicians from uh, different parties struck a deal without uh, really bothering to, to talk to anyone in the educational sector about the feasibility or the merits of the proposal. So it, it came out as a, as a political gesture. Uh, and therefore, you know, those who were on the floor that day 
thought this was a good idea. But now we're faced with the real ramifications of that and are still, I have to say, thinking that something may uh, may be done. So there's, there's a lot of pressure being put uh, at different levels to see if we can get some, uh, some adjustments being made. And in terms of those adjustments, would it be about the, the, the time for implementation or on the, the substance of the proposals themselves or both? I, I'd say both. Uh, as, as Cindy was highlighting before, uh, one should not be thinking of, of sweeping changes like this uh, uh, outside of a system. So in order to, if the finality, uh, the end goal was to have students take three courses in French, this would require uh, significant adjustments to the high school curriculum uh, to ensure that the appropriate level of preparation takes place so that in due time, when they arrive at the uh, college level, they could potentially do well. So yes, a little bit of time uh, to allow alignment between the high school curriculum and the college curriculum to also allow parents and students to make the appropriate choices and adjustments that they need to make. Uh, that would certainly be one thing. But the irony, I think, uh, that, that's been pointed out many times to, to the, the government is that if the intent was generally to increase the level of competency in French, the thing that should have been allowed in the, in, in the amendment is for some of those courses, for some students to actually be French second language courses. Because for some of our incoming students, the biggest, uh, the, the best thing you could do for them, if you do want to increase French, is to give them French second language courses. For yeah. others that are coming to us essentially bilingual, perhaps they can take the course, uh, the history course in French. So, but the amendment as it stands is actually forbidding for those courses to be French second language courses, mm -hmm. which, which is uh, uh, difficult to comprehend why they decided to do that. So that's one of the things, for example, we're pressuring the government to say, if you must adopt an amendment and if we must have French courses, could, could it be at least that you give flexibility and autonomy mm -hmm. that we can do, we can offer to the student the, the best uh, tailored course to meet their needs so that all students, no matter what the initial level is, can actually increase their capacity and their level of comfort in French. Right. Yeah, that's very compelling. Okay, um, Alexandra, so from the perspective of CEGEP students, so your, your colleagues at Dawson, um, what's, your, what's your take on this and how are your colleagues reacting to this? Um, well, there's certainly a lot of anxiety uh, among students, um, particularly when it comes to the recent amendments uh, for the core French courses. Um, as it's already been highlighted, uh, there's been discussion over the years to add additional, um, even from our own students, uh, students have a, you know, shown ongoing demand to increase the, the options and the diversity of the French curriculum um, in Anglophone stages, but and particularly at Dawson. Um, but as was mentioned, no one saw coming the, the mandatory core courses. Um, and so the reason this is a, um, an important distinction that that's causing a lot of anxiety for students is that these courses are, are highly technical, um, uh, not just in, in the technical programs, even in the pre-university programs, um, these core courses uh, uh, may be um, fundamental to uh, the overall success uh, of the students and their programs. Um, and uh, in particular, this will be difficult for non-traditional students, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second, but even for the uh, quote unquote average um, Anglophone college student, um, five out of uh, roughly 30 courses, which is um, the average courses needed for a college diploma, um, is, is, not, is not a little. That's, uh, that's almost a full semester worth of, of, of French courses if you include the uh, mandatory, the already mandatory um, French second language uh, college uh, courses and including the new uh, mandatory three core courses. So that, that greatly affects, that greatly um, changes uh, fundamentally what a college uh, curriculum, what that trajectory looks like for the incoming students. Um, and they'll have to make their decisions um, about the college diploma based on where they may vary if they're not already bilingual, they may have to make decisions about their college education based on their strength of French. Um, and in particular, um, unfortunately, this will impact 
um, the most students that have thus far been maybe left out of the conversation because unfortunately we, we haven't seen um, exclusions. Um, there may be still time to change that uh, before the um, before the the bill passes or the election. But thus far, politicians have not discussed exclusions for say um, um, indigenous students or, as was mentioned, students with um, accessibility or, or learning issues, um, and uh, also as, as well out of province or. Um, international students. So if I think of the current cohort at Dawson, um, just within uh, just within you know your average um, group of Dawson students, you'll find students that uh, graduated from uh, other provinces who um, may very well at, at this at this uh, by the time they get to Dawson have increased their their um, French as a language to a significant le level of bilingualism. But even then, based on their um, formative education out of province, they going forward, the out of province students may not be able to consider um, colleges in Quebec. And that would greatly change the landscape of um, the SAGEP network as a whole if, if we're fundamentally making a decision to um, implicitly change the level of attraction we have um, for students outside of Quebec. Um, so, and as well, this is also true for international students as well, who may very well just choose to forego a college education in Quebec altogether, whereas currently we do see international students um, enrolling at Dawson and showing interest in some of the innovative programs that we have at Dawson. Um, so these will be unfortunate uh, effects and um, rather than positioning the, the college system in Quebec as, um, as a attractive, a, a point of pride in our society. It seems as though we're cutting, um, uh, limiting the opportunities for the future generation. And um, so students who, whether they, they previously um, were considering uh, attending an uh, Anglophone CEGEP because they're primarily identify as a, uh, an Anglophone uh, person in Quebec, or whether um, they do have a, a, a background that, um, that positions them a little bit differently. Um, they'll, they have to consider different factors now going forward. Um, and as it's already been said uh, earlier today, this will certainly have an impact on, on enrollment in the long term. So Alexandra, I mean, two questions. Were, were you or other students consulted at all about this? Have you been consulted since this amendment was proposed? And do you expect that there will be some response by students? In the formal um, Bill 96 consultations that took place in fall 2021, uh, students were not represented. So as a whole, students were not consulted. Um, and, and that's true for the um, for all Anglophone uh, student associations, unfortunately. Um, more recently, as everyone else already highlighted, when the amendments were announced, uh, it took us all by surprise. Um, so I wouldn't say that there was any consultation at that level. Since then, there's definitely been a lot of discussion um, between um, uh, concerned groups and organizations with uh, at the government. But I don't know that that's um, from a standpoint of consultation so much as uh, hoping hoping to, to rectify the issue. Um, as we've seen recently. Um, and on the forward, issue of mobilization, I'm just, just interested in, I mean, obviously people feel very strongly about this. I was just wondering whether you anticipate that students are gonna mobilize around this. Students are, are starting more and more to understand sort of the imminent threat. And so recently um, in the last week or two, uh, thanks in part to a lot of the, um, the publications that, have been released and some of the people in this room um, helped to speak to the media about that. So students are becoming more aware. And yes, we have seen increasing demand for mobilization in, in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, so we are hoping, um, we are hoping to, to make progress on that um, and with some other student groups as well. Okay. So I have a question here from the chat, uh, which I'd like to read and if anyone uh, would feel comfortable in answering it. So says it has been suggested that if Bill 96 comes to fruition, 
the, free, the three French courses within the discipline will take effect in 2023. So would this mean that students who begin up in the fall, so the fall of 2022, next September, will they be grandfathered? Um, and so will they be obliged to, to meet this requirement of the three courses or is it what, so when does it actually, who is it gonna affect and when? So Christian, can you answer that? Well, yes, uh, I think so. Uh, what's, uh, what's been said is that there would be a, a form, as you were saying, of, of grandfathering. So therefore, uh, the new provisions of the bill would apply to students who are being admitted as part of the fall 2023 cohort. So therefore, those who are starting this coming fall uh, would function under the uh, pre current regime. Uh, Cindy. So if I may, I, I, I would like, because uh, I see there's lots of great comments in the chat and, and, uh, and I just wanna say, I appreciate the passion everyone has. I, I think we have to be very aware that this is a complex nuanced issue and the solutions that some propose, such as let's just hire more French teachers and teach more French in elementary and secondary um, I, I'm not going to dispute that. That's the conversation for a different day. But we have a very practical problem. And I'm sure you could speak to it, Michael, far better than I. But just looking at the shortage of teachers, generally speaking, and knowing that the three English universities that graduate teachers out of the teacher training programs, they're now being sought by all over Canada to go and teach because French immersion has just exploded all across Canada. So we have a very real issue of supply and demand that even if we up the demands in the youth sector and in the SEJEP sector, our universities train the teachers who teach these courses. These are This is a very complex area when you're teaching French, whether it be second language or French language of instruction. That requires a university level of training. That takes, in Quebec, the four-year program is a four-year teacher training program. So we are already struggling with teachers perhaps leaving the profession early, going to other provinces, doing other, other things. The pandemic's only shown that to be a Quebec-wide problem. But I dare say the English sector has been onto this for a while because we know there's a huge demand to learn French all over Canada. So we, we have to also realize this, even with a grandfathering or implementation only in 2023, we, we don't have teachers, we, we, every year we graduate teachers, but we will not fill this teacher shortage issue by 2023. We're, we're three, four years down the road. And even then, as my colleague from Aeronopolis has said, we, we all have to talk together. So the universities have to talk to the youth, the school boards, the school boards need to talk with the SEJEPs. Um, those things take time just to work out the mechanics of what are we talking about and how are we going to get all those pieces in place that need to be in place for our students to succeed. And I would hate for our students to lose out while we all try to rearrange the system um, with very little notice or understanding of what it is we're trying to accomplish other than more French, which again, I don't think we're arguing more French may be part of the solution, but then you need time to get there in a very organized, coherent way. Right. Um, first, a question that I have in, in at McGill and at Bishops and Concordia, so the three English universities, we have a provision, we all have an, a significant number of Francophone students. And we allow our Francophone students taking a course in English to write their exams and papers in French. Is that something which exists in the SEJA? Uh, to, to my knowledge, not in any kind of uh systematic way. And I suppose th this is an example of something that could be uh, uh, looked at in the future. But, but I have to say that, you know, at the moment, uh, my energy, our energy uh, is towards what can we do to modify things. We've heard Premier Legault and I've had the opportunity to uh, have discussions directly with his cabinet. Uh, and we're told, and it's been quoted in the media, that Premier Legault is reflecting so uh, at the moment, yes, I think we can look at all sorts of solutions and, and adjustments and we'll be creative and work together with our, with our faculty, with our students and with the school boards and we'll figure this out if the bill comes to pass. But 
as it stands, as, as we're speaking uh, right now, this bill, this amendment is still a proposal. So I still hold hope that uh, the, the government will see the, that, the, that there's something that needs to be done. So I, I'm hesitant to, to explore solutions too fast because right. I, I, I think it gives the impression that we've accepted the bill and we're now at the, uh, you know, living with it. I think there's a window, a short window to perhaps uh, uh, bring some significant changes. So uh, to me, the, the, the battle is still on on that. But yes, down the road, uh, that's the sort of thing that could be explored. Okay. There are a number of questions in the chat about the, uh, the cap on, uh, on enrollment in the SAGEP. So here's one, for example, has there been any, has there been any concerns from our Francophone students who will not be able to have access to in the SAGEP if the proposal caps the number of French students. So as a, a number of people have asked if, if you would speak to this issue of the, uh, the ceiling that's uh, being placed on the number of um, Francophone students uh, attending um, English Asia. So does anyone wanna take that? I can try perhaps, uh, Michael, on that. Uh, yeah. the, the the ceiling is 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 actually in terms of it's a system wide ceiling. So there are you know the, the number that's often quoted is roughly thirty thousand students based on the two thousand nineteen numbers that are currently enrolled in uh, anglophone institutions and the eight anglo institutions, the five public and the three private that have been now labeled anglophone institutions. So it's a zero sum game. So therefore. The system as a whole cannot grow. And, and one of the other amendments that was presented last minute uh, on top of uh, the French courses is to introduce a permanent freeze on enrollment. So until the end of times, uh, Anglo colleges are capped at their 2019 uh, levels, no matter uh, if there are demographic changes or needs. So this is now frozen uh, forever. And so therefore, uh, it limits our ability to eventually be able to meet, uh, you know, if there are and more students interested in our, in our system. So per se, uh, it's, a, it's a cap on enrollment uh, and uh, it will therefore limit and shrink uh, all of the Anglophone institutions in the coming years. Uh, to, they will have to reduce their 2019 numbers. In a context in Montreal, there's actually more students in the system. So they'll have to essentially go to the French, uh, to the French uh, colleges. So in that sense, uh, because it's a zero sum game, uh, if a given institution wants to see its enrollment increased, the only way that this can happen is for another college to lower its enrollment because the total must remain the same. And similarly, within a given institution, if, for example, one could imagine there would be uh, an interest in increasing the number of graduates and, let's say, a healthcare field, the only way an English college could do this is by reducing enrollment in one of the other programs. Because we're frozen as an institution, we're also frozen as a system. So in that sense, uh, it, it limits our ability to grow. And, and there is a bit of an intent, I think that's clearly laid out of diminishing the, the, the relative weight of uh, English college in the system. So that, that's clearly the intent over time. So Christian pointed out that this is still, um, it's a projet de loi, it's not, the loi hasn't, hasn't been adopted. Um, and the premier has said that he's reflecting on this. I'm just interested in hearing from the four of you what you think can and should be done and, and who should be doing it. So Catherine, maybe back to you, you know, what is you and your association considering doing? One of the things that we were considering doing is holding a protest somewhere to, to show people, um, show politicians, because that's what they seem to care about, that we absolutely don't want any part of this amendment. I know there was some talks and I've saw in the chat that some people seem to think that, you know, maybe we can take a lesser, you know, degree of this amendment. Absolutely not. We want none of it. That's one thing that we would, uh, that I would like to see, you know, if, if other parents want to join, join us in doing. Another thing is writing to our, to the MNAs, keep writing, you know, letters. Um, don't say, don't stay silent. Don't let this, don't let this happen. Use your voice and yeah, let's mobilize. Let's do something. It's very important uh, that politicians understand that they do not have the right 
to tell our children and decide for our children their futures. They do not. I know I'm passionate about this, but this hits close to home because this is what will happen to my children. And the answer is absolutely not. So those are some of the things that I suggest uh, that we do. Okay. Cindy, what do you, where do you think we go from here and what are you considering? Well, I mean, certainly some things, you know, have, have been in the process. Uh, you know, we, this amendment did sort of come out of nowhere. We have had a discussion at the director's general table of the nine English school boards, uh, along with Mr. Copeman from QESBA. Uh, we, we also should not forget, we, we as, a, as a group, or, you know, I'll speak for myself, I feel very strongly, as I said at the beginning, this is an issue that impacts education that's being debated by parliamentarians who are perhaps not experts in education. And so LCEQ, the group I chair, we have written a letter to both Minister McCann and Minister Roberge to say, this is so critical because it affects the education system. We implore you as ministers of higher education and education to become involved and to become concerned about the detrimental impact that this entire legislation could have, but particularly those uh, amendments. The other thing I think it's important to also point out and not forget is that there is a secretariat for English speaking Quebecers and the point of that secretariat is to help move those different ministries because it, it, it affects so many different pieces in a system that's always in movement that I think it would be good to make yes the MNAs and the, and the politicians certainly should be made aware but there is this existing secretariat that is there to look after the interests of English speaking Quebecers. And I know they have done a lot of work to look at the labor force, to look at what happens in post-secondary uh, as well as education. And so it would be important for people to realize there are different levers and uh, we should certainly explore those and try to get as many people A, aware of what the issues are and then B, propose uh, ways that we could move forward. Okay, uh, Christian, same question. What, what do you think needs to be done and, and by whom? You know, I think at, at this point, uh, you know, it's good that we're doing this webinar to raise awareness and, uh, and, and hopefully build a level of understanding what the bill entails. But there's been no shortage of meetings and I've certainly uh, taken part of many of those with m as with the cabinet, with Mr. Jean Barrett's office. Uh, that, that work has been done and invariably the answer is public opinion. And this is what their own advisors are saying that we, I think we've exa all nearly exhausted all the traditional back channels of, of uh, you know, meeting with politicians and, and certainly it's important to keep this up. But until students, parents uh, speak up and, and do something, I, I think it's not gonna get the politicians attention because anytime my take that the government hears from, from me or from Cindy, we're perceived as administrators who are concerned about the challenges and the problems and the technicalities of things. So uh, what we have not heard much of in any structured way is the voice of students, the voice of parents, or the voice of the English community. So uh, that at this point, um, I'm hearing the, the politicians and their advisors telling me, well, we've not heard much. So it's not, uh, moving that needle. Because when Premier Legault said he's reflecting, we have to understand he's looking at polls and surveys. And so at the moment, uh, this matter is not being discussed in the French media, is not generating a whole lot of attention outside of you know, a few media outlets in recent days. And it's good that this happened. But uh, I, I, I'm concerned that unless something a little bit more um, significant, which would capture the imagination that uh, we may not get to, we may be looking at what you were saying, Michael, before at doing damage control and looking what kind of measures we can do to, to mitigate the impact. But uh, that, that's my take is that at the moment, uh, we, we, need, we need the members of the English community to speak up and uh, get uh, the, the attention of politicians. So Alexandra, I guess uh, you know one of the, the groups that could be mobilizing around this, and we know how effective students can be uh, as a voice in the society when they do act together. Um, again, any sense amongst yourself and the heads of the other uh, student associations in the SAGEPs as to whether this is going to result in a mobilization? 
Uh, well, I know that th certainly the associations are are discussing this and and meeting about this. Um, I think that um, if we have student students of any uh, CEGEP, uh in the audience tonight, um, uh, I think this is definitely a, a green light to uh, contact your local student association and um, ask what uh, what your student association is doing about uh, mandates uh, to this effect. Um, that's what we're discussing um, at the Dawson Student Union. We represent just over 10,000 um, uh, students. It's the biggest uh, college membership in the network. So uh, we will certainly continue to mobilize. I, I do hope that the politicians don't get uh, sick of us um, <laughs> Uh, taking trips down to Quebec City too much, but um, we're we're open to um, working with any student groups across the province. Um, of course, francophone uh, associations are uh, do believe um, thus far um, uh, do believe very much in in Bill ninety six and and what CAC is um, proposing uh, with the with the goals that it. Uh, with the amendments for Bill 96. Um, that may be unfortunate for us, but I think it's important that the Anglophone community and, and Anglophone college students continue to try to uh, communicate and um, uh, extend um, uh, extend a, a hand to, to continue to, to work on improving um, understanding between Francophone and Anglophone communities across the province as well. Um, but again, please, if you are uh, a, a student, um, I encourage you to get involved. Um, if you're passionate about Bill 96, uh, as soon as possible, to reach out with, to your student association and know that um, we're also talking behind the scenes, so. Okay, thank you, Alexandra. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Russell for some closing thoughts. I'll, I'll just say, I mean, it's clear in listening to the four of you and looking at some of the comments in the chat and just the number of people involved in this, there is a a deep, deep concern about the impact on students, first and foremost, and their ability to be successful. And that's one of the responsibilities a government should have to ensure that students can be successful. Um, and the impact on our institutions, uh, from all of our education institutions, that's also very clear from listening to you. And if, if there is a genuine desire to improve the quality of French uh, capacity within uh, the English speaking community. That's something that all of you on this call and others who have experience with pedagogy need to be involved in. And it can't be a solution which, which is just imposed on the SAGEPs. It has to be something which is a comprehensive response. And that requires a lot of time and thought that uh, this proposal doesn't seem to have allowed for. Anyway, Russell, I'm going to. Turn it over to you for some closing thoughts. So one of the dangers in uh, following someone as um, adept and erudite as Principal Goldblum is that he says some of the things you were going to say in uh, one was going to say in the wrap up. But uh, I, I'm told that uh, that uh, pedagogy is the art of repetition. So I'll repeat some of those. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I, I saw in the chat some people saying, of course, will Bill 96 be adopted? It's, it's impossible to say. It's still in parliamentary committee. They're doing what is known as their clause by clause study. Um, the bill contains 201 sections. And this afternoon, when I tuned in to watching it on the National Assembly, they, they had started their work today on sections 100, section 125. So there's some work to be done that's ongoing in, in Parliamentary Committee. And then, of course, it leaves Parliamentary Committee and comes before the National Assembly, the full National Assembly, in various stages. Um, and the National Assembly rises in early June and will not reconvene. So uh, if it is going to be adopted, it will have to be done between now and June. And so there is a window of opportunity there. It is not a, a fait accompli. I, you know, what's clear, I think, from panelists and from reaction in the public is that there's a high level of anxiety and concern about uh, the, the effects of these new, three new uh, compulsory courses on student success. 
and uh, you know it's it's been expressed by parents and uh, and pedagogues and students and that's obviously very very clear you know i was struck by uh, that important distinction made by uh, both uh, uh, dr finn and and mr corneau that you know our elementary and high school curriculum are are designed to teach french as a second language not necessarily to prepare english sejep students to pass three core or program courses in French, and that learning in French is very different than learning French. And that's one of the challenges with this amendment. Um, a number of panelists talk about creating a barrier to success, and that's, uh, you know, and, and it will have detrimental uh, effects, uh, uh, potentially effects on that all important R score um, uh, for many English speaking students. And you know, it, 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 we're, I think we're looking at a significant negative impact on student success. And of course, then there's the whole issue of the enrollment cap and what that will mean to uh, institutions of the English speaking community like English language Seychelles. So you know, what, what to do? Um, I, I think this can be corrected as uh, Director General Corneau mentioned and others. Um, there are various legislative possibilities uh, to correcting this, but all will require the cooperation uh, and the goodwill at this point of the majority party in the National Assembly. No correction can be made of any type without the cooperation and goodwill of the uh, CAQ government. So what are some of those options? Well, I think everyone's first option would be to remove this requirement uh, for three additional courses uh, in French in order to graduate completely. Um, another possibility, I think that's everyone's first choice. Um, sometimes politics is the art of the possible. So there may be other uh, options. Uh, you know, Director General Corneau talked about allowing the flexibility for English language SEGEPs to find a workable solution to this if it goes ahead. And, uh, you know, the third option might be to uh, push for sufficient time to implement this change as deleterious as many of us think it will be without negatively impacting students. The reality is that these solutions require cooperation of legislators and require pressure, right? So I think it's, it would be very significant that people email Premier Legault on this su subject, email the Minister of Education, Jean-Francois Roberge, get in contact with the higher education minister, Daniel McCann and Minister Jolain Barrette himself. May, Je pense également, euh, euh, Monsieur le Recteur, qu'il serait important que nous faisons appel à nos députés et ministres. Cet amendement produira des effets inattendus. Elle n'a pas été, elle a été adoptée sans consultation. Elle n'a pas été suffisamment étudiée. Il y aura manifestement des effets négatifs réels sur beaucoup de nos étudiants de langue anglaise. Alors, je pense qu'il faut qu'on fasse appel à eux pour corriger cette situation. Il y a encore le temps, il y aura des opportunités pendant le processus législatif. We need them to do the right thing. We need them to rise above partisanship and correct this mistake. Uh, we need to help them see that, uh, and that and that they should do the right thing. So, one of the messages I also heard is that you want uh, and people want uh, community groups and associations within the English speaking community to do more. And so we will reflect on what those next steps might be in order to try and, uh, and correct this situation, which will have such a negative effect on the success of so many students. Okay, uh, well said, Russell, thank you. So. Thank you to our, our panelists. Thank you to the, what, more than 300 people who uh, participated in this webinar. Obviously an issue of, of great concern for, for the community. And um, I, think, I hope we all come away from this with a sense that we need to find, we each are gonna have to find a way to try and influence this so that, um, so that it does not go forward as proposed. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for the leadership that our our four panelists are showing and uh, to the different organizations who help sponsor the, this webinar. So thank you all. <laughs>